tonight to Genesis, and Genesis chapter 3, I'm sure there's not a man in Northern Ireland, or indeed in Ireland, maybe could even recite a part of this chapter, and it's to do with the fall of man, and the Lord has uh, heavily laid this a little passage upon my heart for tonight. And we're just going to read slowly from verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis. And we're just going to read down to verse 10, just the first 10 verses this evening. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat? Of every tree of, the, tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, notice those three words, good and pleasant and desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, or if you have your margin, it'll say the breeze or the wind of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called, Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And we'll end our reading there. Father, we just come before thee once again tonight. And Lord, we just ask now, just as we come to your word, Lord, that you would illuminate it to us. We know that the natural man can't discern the things of God, for they're spiritually discerned. And Lord, we would ask you, Lord, oh God, that you would anoint the lips of this preacher and anoint the ears of the hearers. Father, that we would hear the still, small voice of God. And so, Lord, I just surrender afresh to thee just now. And I ask you, O oh God, my Father, that you'd fill me afresh with the Holy Ghost and with power. For we ask it in the lovely name of your Son. Amen. You all know the background uh, to this little this passage tonight that we've read for, I'm sure many a times you've heard it even read in Sunday school. You've heard it maybe even uh, people on the street, you'll, if you're doing door-to-door work, someone will come to you and they'll maybe take you back to the fall of man. How God in there in chapter 2 said, Thou shalt not eat of, thou shalt eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And then as we read that Satan, he came and he sowed a little seed of deception, just one little seed. One little seed of doubt in the mind of Eve and said, Hath God said? Hath God said? And I was thinking about it during the week and praying over it. And you know, Eve maybe started to run over in her mind. Well, I wasn't even there whenever Adam heard from God not to eat of the the fruit of the tree of good and evil. I wasn't there. I'm only taking his word for it. I wasn't there. And this little seed of, of doubt, hath God said? Hath God really said? And then he came and he sowed another seed and he, he said, Ye shall not surely die. He sowed a little bit of doubt and then he sowed a little seed of deceit. Thou shalt not surely die. 
And you know, I just want to throw the line out tonight to those maybe that are in the meeting and you're sitting here tonight and you're not saved or you're listening to me on the tape or on the CD or whatever you're listening on. And maybe the old serpent has came to you and he said, you'll, you'll not die. You'll not die. You know, there's people on earth today who think genuinely that they'll never die. Part of the Hindu religion there, one of the sects of it, uh, believe that if they keep a good moral life, that they'll never die. Physically, they'll never die. And here was this serpent came to Eve and said, ye shall not surely die. And it's a great big enemy, isn't it? But I want to say to you tonight in this meeting that every single one of us are going to die if the Lord doesn't come. It's a big enemy, death. And then Eve, she looked upon the fruit and we saw that she saw that it was good to the eyes, good for food, and then good to the, pleasant to the eyes, and then to be desired. And you'll remember how the Apostle John, how he wrote in 1 John 2 and verse 16, he talks about the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life, and Eve hit every one of them. She saw that it was good for food, that's the lust of the flesh. She saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. That's the lust of the, the, lust of the eyes. And then she thought, saw that it was be desired for wisdom. And that's uh, that's uh, uh, the pride of life. And you know, as I was praying and meditating over it, so often we fall into sins in our own lives. And you know, we hit every single one of them. It looks good. It looks very pleasant. It looks even for someone to desire it. And then it says she took it. She took it. And I can look over in my life whenever I saw the things in the world, they were pleasant. And I thought that they were good. And I thought that they were to be desired. And I can honestly look back in my life and I can see those days where I reached out and I took it. And here was Eve. She took this forbidden fruit. She saw that it was good and that it was pleasant and to be desired. And then she went and she gave it to her husband and he did eat. And at that psychological moment in the time of the universe, sin entered the human race. At that split second, whenever Adam took of the fruit of the garden, sin entered the human race. And you know, dear friends, it has crippled mankind ever since. Crippled. And I was starting to write down over some of the things, some of the wars that has happened since sin came into the world. There's been war, and there's been sickness, and there's been famine, and there's been disease, and there's been death. One man, one woman, reached out their hand, and they took that which they were forbidden to take. And sin entered the human race. And you know, every single man and woman since Adam and Eve, since that moment in the garden, you'll remember how they were driven from the presence of God. They didn't have to do another thing. They didn't have to say another thing. But you remember how the Lord set an angel at the garden, at the gate of the garden to protect it. And they were driven from the very presence of God. And I want to say tonight that it will not matter, dear friends, what you and I do. It will not matter what we say. It will not matter where we go. But as we were born into this world, the psalmist could say, I was born in sin and shape and in iniquity. We were born in that little bundle laying in a cot with the nature of sin within each and every one of us. And there's been bigger sinners. And there's been good sinners like religious sinners and moral sinners, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the very solemn thing about it tonight is we're all the offspring of Adam and Eve. Every single one of us. We maybe look different and we're maybe different ages, but we've all got one thing in common. We've got the same father and the same mother. Well, if we were to trace our line the way back, we would find that Adam and Eve was our original parents. And we inherited that sin nature. You think of the trouble that has come into the world since sin came. And then Adam and Eve, what they did, you'll remember how their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. And the old serpent was very cunning and very cute, for he told Eve that that's what was going to happen. You see, the devil sometimes just doesn't come to us and tell us lies, out abrupt lies. Sometimes he mixes it with a little bit of truth. 
You think of rat poison there. I think is it only 2% that's poisonous. 98% of it's all right. You can eat it. But only 2% and it's deadly. And here was a serpent, the dev, Satan himself. He made a concoction of truth and lies that ruined mankind. And here was Adam, now that he took of the forbidden fruit, and the first thing that happened to him, and you'll get it in verse 7, it says their eyes of them were both opened, and they saw. And then not only did it say that they saw, but they knew. And then it goes on to say that they made themselves aprons of fig leaves. And I want to say this tonight, that these, this couple didn't have a Bible. They never heard a sermon being preached. They hadn't gone to a convention. They had never read a gospel tract, but they knew that they were sinners in the sight of God. They knew because their eyes were open. And what they did is they went and gathered fig leaves and made themselves an apron. And I want to ask you a question tonight as you sit in this meeting tonight. What apron have you made? What apron? Maybe you're sitting here tonight and uh, you're not on drugs and drink and we're so tired of hammering drug addicts and alcoholics, but what apron have you made? Maybe you've made an apron of good works. Maybe you've gathered fig leaves of religion. Maybe you have gathered fig leaves of being a good person and a moral person or a a righteous person, a hard-working person, and you've covered over the sin by fig leaves. What what, what apron are you wearing tonight? What apron? And Adam and Eve, they made themselves this apron to cover their shame. And how they sewed it together, I do not know. But once they had done it, it says in the cool of the day, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Do not ask me what that means whenever God walked in the garden, for I do not know. But all I know is they heard the voice of God. And you know, they took to their heels. Let me paint a little picture for you. They're standing in the garden of Eden. They've taken of the forbidden fruit. Their eyes are opened and they see their nakedness and they see their shame. They see their depravity. And they run into the bushes and they gather fig leaves from off the trees and they sew together aprons and they they hide their shame. And they maybe sit down and they say, everything's all right now, I'm covered over. I can't see your shame, Adam. You can't see mine. We're covered over. And then in the breeze of the day, in the cool of the day, there came a voice. A voice. And oh, I would pray tonight in this meeting that you would hear the voice. The voice of God. And he met with the voice of God came and he said, Adam, where art thou? Where art thou? And I can picture Adam and Eve and they they run and they start to run now into the thick of the bushes and into the trees. It says they ran and hid themselves in the trees, among the trees of the garden. And they ran and they took to their heels and they tried to get as far and far away from where they heard the voice of God and they kept running and they kept running and they couldn't run anymore. They couldn't run anymore. And they hid themselves among the trees. Oh, I tell you, dear friends, there was maybe the tree of wealth they were hiding behind. Oh, there could have been juking behind the the tree there of respectability. Or maybe they were hiding behind the the tree of just uh, pushing God out of the way. I don't want to hear anymore. I'm tired of hearing this gospel message. I'm tired of hearing the voice of God every Sunday that I'm a sinner and I know I need to get saved. I'm tired of it. And they took to their heels and they ran. Are you running tonight? Are you running? And they started to run. And the harder they ran and the harder they ran, the voice seemed to get louder and louder and louder. Where art thou? Where art thou? And those are the three words I want to drum into your mind tonight. Just for another 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Where art thou? 
Where are you? You know, there's nearly three. I think the scholars say there's somewhere in between three and a half thousand questions in the Bible. And this was the first question that God asked a man. Where art thou? And maybe you're here tonight and you're saying, well, this is a gospel meeting and I can just sit here and I can just look as if I'm interested for I'm saved. But friend, this question comes to you tonight. Even if you're saved, where art thou? And I want to throw three things to you tonight very quickly. I want you to see this question. Just three words. And I want you to see for a moment a very simple question. It's a question that even a child would ask. And maybe you fathers or mothers that are in the meeting, you maybe heard your child running one day and you said, where are you? Daddy, where are you? Mother, where are you? Where are you? Where art thou? And if I was to draw alongside you tonight and I was to ask you, where are you morally? You would tell me you're maybe as clean as a whistle. If I was to ask you, where are you mentally? Oh, you would say I'm in good shape. If I was to ask you, where are you financially? Well, you'd be able to give me the digits and the statistics. But let me throw out the line to you tonight and honestly in your soul, answer me this, where are you spiritually tonight? Where art thou? Where are you tonight, really? Are you duking among the bushes? Are you hiding yourself under an apron of fig leaves? Where art thou? You see, Adam was the first only man on planet earth at this time. Eve was the only woman. And I pray over this meeting tonight that God will isolate you from everyone in this meeting and he'll come in now and just zone into you and say, right, where are you? Where are you? And could I say tonight just to those of us in the meeting that are saved, where are you? Where are you? How close to God are you? How great of a desire have you for the word of God? How great of a desire have we for the prayer, for prayer and talking to God? How great a desire have we for just getting alone and getting to know him? Where art thou? Where art thou? Where are you tonight if I was to lay out this simple question and was to ask you, where are you in relation to God? Are you in his family? Or are you in the family of the devil, the child of the devil? Where are you tonight? You see, God knew very well where Adam was. But he wanted Adam to realize where he was. And friend, I would just ask you just for a moment tonight, just to still your heart and honestly contemplate and say, whereabouts are you tonight? Where are you? Some of you that are older in the meeting and you're coming to the end of your life. You know, it'll not be too long till you'll be lying in bed and people will have to feed you and to clothe you and to wash you. But where are you tonight spiritually? Where are you? It's a simple question. If I was to ask you tonight, where is the, what's the condition of your soul like? What's your condition like? If I was to ask you, where are you in relation to sin? Would you have to say that you're still carrying your sin, that you've never been saved, you're not born again, you're still lost out in the mountains, wild and bare, and you don't want anything to do with God? You don't want this salvation? You don't want the cross and you don't want the blood and you don't want forgiveness. You don't want anything to do with it. Where are you? And maybe you'll come to church just to pass an hour. You'll come just to seem like a good person or you'll go to plea someday. But friends, where are you tonight? Where are you? And this maybe seems like a simple little message and it is. It's a simple man that's preaching it. But answer me the question, where are you? Are you forgiven tonight? Are you saved tonight? You see, Adam, he took to his heels and he started to run. No, oh, I'm sure he would have quoted it if it, if it had been written. 
And if he had had a Bible, I'm sure he would have turned to Psalm 139 and he'd have read, Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and shall fly away unto the uttermost parts of the earth, behold, thou art there. I want to say to you tonight, if you're trying to run from God, give it up. Give up. If you're trying to hide something in your life tonight, and I did it for years, friends, honestly, I can say that in my life, I was saved. And I tell, tell it all the time, and I'm never sick of telling it. I was saved. I was coming to the lifeboat, sitting in the meeting, sitting around the Lord's table, baptized. But there were things in my life that I was covering up. Aprons. Aprons. Oh, you know, the suit was good and the tie was good and all that's great and wear it and keep wearing it. But it'll never cover it up. Aprons. I think of sins in my life, dear friends, and if I was to quote them to you tonight, you would say that I wasn't even saved and I would probably agree with you. Aprons. And maybe this message isn't for the gospel. Maybe this is just for the saved people in the lifeboat tonight. Where are you? Tell me this. Where were you? If I was to turn the question around. If I was to ask you the question, where were you at during the week, where, what would you say? If I was to ask you, where were you at on Monday night at nine o'clock, what were you watching on TV, what would you say? If I was to ask you, husbands, where were you at when your wife went to bed, what would you say? Where art thou? Where art thou? Or maybe a wife, whenever your husband and the children went to bed or were at work, and no one knew where you were at. And yet tonight, the voice of God that hunted down Adam in the, in the garden says, tonight, where were you? Where were you? Well, you don't need to answer to me. But you have to answer to God. You see, it's a very simple question. But secondly and quickly, it's a very searching question. Very searching. You see, as I was praying and meditating over that, you can't answer that question for me. Only I can answer it. And I can't answer the question for you, but only you can answer it. Where art thou? Where art thou? Where were you? You see, it's a very searching question. Uh, it goes into the very innermost beings of our lives. It goes into the motives every second of the day, the midnight hour. And now the voice comes down once again. Where art thou? Where were you at? You see, it's a very, very personal question because Adam was the only man on earth, as we'd said. And friend, as this verse comes to, word comes to you tonight, and it came to me, I can assure you, far worse than it came, comes to you. It comes as a very personal question. You remember there was a man by the name of Abraham and he was lying in bed one night and there was a voice came and he was probably lying beside his wife Sarah and he, the voice came and said, take your son to the land of Moriah. His wife didn't hear it, but he heard it. And maybe the Lord's speaking to you tonight in this meeting and not, that one beside you doesn't hear it. And the one behind you or in front of you doesn't hear it, but you hear it. And the Lord's starting to ask you tonight, and he's starting to tighten the rope on you. He says, where are you? Where are you at? Are you really, is, are you really saved? Are you really born again? Are you really on your way to hell? Are you really just a moment from going into a lost eternity? Where are they? And not only is it a very personal question, it's a very pressing question. For he said, where art thou? And he said this, and it came to me with awesome conviction and power. And he said, it didn't say, how are you? Or he didn't say, uh, who are you? He said, where are you? Where? Where? And if I could just draw along beside you tonight, and I honestly don't want to sound hard because I don't want to sound a hard preacher and get into the emotion of just shouting at people. I don't want that. But if I could draw alongside you this evening and honestly say to you, 
Where are you in your Christian walk? Where are you? Would you have to say that you're like on a roundabout going round and round and round? Never getting off. Where are you? You see, he, it's a very pressing question because he was looking at Adam to answer there and then. He didn't give any to Adam any time or he didn't say, no, I'll come back to you in a week or I'll come back to, to you in a year. He said, where art thou? No. No. If God was to burst the clouds and the Lord Jesus Christ was come back tonight, where would you be? Would you be still sitting in that comfortable seat that you're on? Would you still be sitting here with the hymn book and the, and the text up there, Behold, I come quickly. And you know the Lord's saying to some soul, and I know it without a shadow of a doubt tonight, where art thou? Where are you? It's a very personal question. It's a very pressing question. For the Lord doesn't want you to wait till 8 o'clock. He wants you to answer it now. He wants you to answer about those sins in your life tonight, believer. Pornography. Adultery. That wee secret glass of wine. That cigarette. Those old films that you watch whenever nobody's there. He's putting the finger on it tonight. Oh, nobody else knows. I don't know. But he knows. You see, he saw Adam taking the fruit. And he heard him as he bit into it. And you see that sin that you're indulging in? He sees you whenever you're at it. Oh, he sees it. Where art thou? It's a very simple question. Then it's a very searching question. But finally, it's a very serious question. Seriously. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're not saved, and you can honestly say that you're not saved, it's a very serious thing. Very serious. To think tonight that you don't need to be in bad health, or you don't need to be, you don't need to be smoking 40 a day. And you don't need to be lying down in Craig Avon with monitors with a coronary. But you know the only thing that's keeping you from going into eternity tonight. It's the gracious hand of God. And you know, Jonathan Edwards hit the nail in the head and he said in that sermon, the sinners in the hands of an angry God, there's coming a day when he's going to close his hand. And you know, dear friends, I really don't even like saying that because it puts a shiver down my spine. Where are you tonight? It's a very very serious question because you know dear friends there's a day of accountability and there's been things that I have done and said during the week and you know the Lord has rebuked me mightily for and how I even answer and talk to other believers the Lord has really ministered to me over that and there's coming a day of accountability and you know, I want to say tonight to those that are unsaved, as we heard this morning, if you die and you go to a lost eternity, you will go farther into the chasms of a lost hell than all of the men in Africa and all of the men away out in them third world countries that never even heard of the name Jesus. I was reading an epitaph on a, on a gravestone a few weeks ago. And who read it, I do not know. It goes like this. Remember man as you go by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. But where will you be in eternity? Where? Where? Art thou? Let me turn it around. Where will you be? Where will you be? 
Where will you be whenever you take your last gasp? Where will you be when your heart pumps for the last time? Where will you be whenever that coffin's lower down under the ground? I can't answer that question for you tonight. Where art thou? You know, that's the first question that's in the Old Testament that's to man and the Lord's saying it to you tonight. But the very first question that's in the New Testament is, where is he? Oh, praise God for that. You'll remember the wise men, they came from the, from the east. And in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 2, they came and they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And I can point you tonight to a man. Hallelujah for that. A man. Where is he? Oh, let me turn it around just for a little moment as I did before. Where was he? And I could take you for a little moment down the streets of Bethlehem and I could show you a manger. And there lays a little babe, a very ordinary looking babe. Doesn't have a halo on his head. But that little babe grew. It was sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. Here he is now. This is the Son of God. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Where was he? Oh, he was born and laid in a little manger in Bethlehem. Come with me just for a little moment and we'll walk down the streets of Nazareth. And we'll look in through the gates and in through the door of a carpenter's shop. And there he is. Who is he? He's the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Who is he? I can say tonight that he's my Savior. Who is he? I could take you just for a little moment again and we could go up an old dusty path. And on the silhouette of a hill outside Jerusalem, you could see three crosses protruding from that hill. And I could bring you up to that hill and I could show you two men, two thieves that are dying for their crimes. And I could bring you to that center cross and I could say, who is he? He's the savior of the world. Where is he? Oh, he was stripped naked. He was despised of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted of grief. Why? To save, save and riddle from drink and lies and pornography and lust. Hallelujah. And he did it. And he can do the same for you. Who is he? He's the son of God. God was in Christ reconciling the world by himself. By himself. Oh, it was by himself. You remember you could take that little phrase himself. Take it some time and do a study. You'll get it there in Romans 15 and 3. Christ pleased not himself. He was with the Father for all eternity, all of the glory. And then you'll get it in Philippians chapter 2. He humbled himself. Oh, that's big stuff. He humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. And became a, became a fashion as a man. Found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself on the death. Even the death of the cross. Oh, I can see those men delighting and whipping his back. I can see the flesh flying off the prongs of that big leather whip. I can see the Roman soldier coming with a hammer and nailing the nails through the palms of his hand. Who is he? Oh, he's the one who died for you tonight. And if you're in this meeting tonight and you're gripped by sin and you're a believer, he's the one who can deliver you. Oh, you don't need to come to me. I praise God, if the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, who is he? Where was he? And they took that limp body down after that the wrath of God was poured upon him in those three hours of darkness. And after all of that, he could cry, it is finished. He took my hell and he took your hell. Condensed it into three hours. I can't understand it, but tonight I believe it. And that's good. Oh, and then they took that body down. And the, the, the veil in the temple was rent in two, and the grave, the grave shook. And the dead bodies came out, and they started to walk through the streets of Jerusalem. And they took that body, and they laid it at a tomb. Three days in the tomb. Oh, and on the third day, up from the grave, he arose. With a mighty triumph o'er his foes, he arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever. With a saints to reign. Where was he? Oh, he went from the little manger to the cross, to the tomb. But where is he? Oh, you'll get it in the uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. He gave him, what is it there? The brightness, the express image of his person. 
an express image of his, the glory of his person, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty and high. Where is he tonight? Oh, he's on the throne. Where is he tonight? He's in this meeting. Oh, the one that walked the streets of Galilee, the one that was on Mount Calvary, the one that was in the tomb and in the grave, you know where he's at tonight? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. And every time he knocks the door, he, he can hear it getting fainter. Where art thou? Where are you? You remember there, he came to a little house in Nazareth, Bethany. And Martha ran in and she said to Mary, the master's come. And call us for thee. Where is he? He's standing right beside you tonight. You can't see him. You can't feel him. But you can hear him. The hymn writer put it like this. I hear his welcome voice. It calls me now to thee. For cleansing in the precious blood. It flowed. In Calvary. If you're in this meeting tonight and you're a believer and you're backslidden and you would have to answer that question by saying that I'm no longer walking with God, where are you tonight? Not where I used to be. Where are you tonight? I have no desire anymore. I remember you had answered, where are you? I'm not saved tonight. There's only one way to get saved and that's by calling whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You need to repent of your sin tonight. With this I close. On Wednesday night past, I called with an old woman that I've known for years. Her son's not saved. I worked with him. Started talking to him about the things of God. Said, you need to get right. You need to get saved. You need to repent of your sin and ask the Lord into your heart. And you know he had no concern and no desire. And that old mother, about 80 years of age, was sitting in the house and her son went home and I sat on and she said to me, I've got questions. Questions. And I said, what sort of questions? She says, I've went to church all of my life. Read the Bible every night. Sing a wee hymn during the day. But Stevie, I... I don't think I'm saved. Not saved. And you know, I turned to that dear woman and I said, you know, there's only one thing that you need to do and that you need to do it now and you need to get down on your knees or get in your seat and say, Lord, I'm a sinner and I've rejected you all of my life. And just now, on the 16th of May, 2016, I'm asking you into my heart to save me. I'm sorry, Lord, for telling people that I'm saved and living a religious life and going through the motion. Sorry, Lord. And that old mother got down on the seat on Tuesday night. And she didn't have big words and she didn't have big phrases. And she prayed something like this, Lord Jesus, I want you to save me. I want you to cleanse me from my sin. I want you to deliver me, Lord, from all that thing, those things in my life that no one else knew anything about and I never heard a bang nor never seen an angel. But that woman got saved. Where art thou? Let us pray.
Father, we just lay everything before you, for we don't even know what to say, Lord. But oh, we would cry that we would hear that tender voice as Adam heard in the garden. Where art thou? And Lord, I would pray over those in this meeting tonight that are cold and backslidden and struggling with sins in their life. And Lord, you know exactly where they are tonight. We were once there ourselves. And Lord, I pray what you did for me that you'll do for them. Lord, I pray and I thank you that I'm not some sort of a spiritual giant that, oh God, but I pray, Lord, that you deliver these people. Pray for those in the meeting, Lord, that are not saved. Oh God, I pray in your tenderness that you'll woo them to Calvary. Oh, that they'll see the Son of God there bearing sin and scoffing root. The load of their guilt and their shame upon them. Crying, where art thou? Oh God, we pray and we just ask you, Lord, to take us home to our homes in safety tonight. Lord, I cry and I plead from my soul. Oh God, in your tenderness and your love, do something that I cannot do. Do something that men cannot do. For we ask it in the lovely name of your Son. Amen.